This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 38 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the podcast, I really, really do appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. I know there's only so many hours in the day, so many minutes in the day, and the fact that you are using some of them to uh, listen to me talk about homesteading is greatly appreciated. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And before we get started today, let me first of all apologize that I am a day late in getting this podcast out. So I have been publishing these at uh, midnight on Monday mornings. But this past weekend was 4th of July, and so it's a big celebration weekend here for our family. Beyond just the fact that it is Independence Day here in the U.S., um, that is usually the weekend on which my mom's side of the family has their family reunion. And so it was a busy weekend for us helping set up, going to the reunion. And then yesterday afternoon, my cousin James and his wife Wendy stopped by the homestead and visited. And so something had to give, and it was the podcast. So thank you very much for your patience. Uh, This is the first time in uh, 38 episodes. Actually, it's 37. I did throw a bonus episode in there. So it's actually 37 weeks since I've started this. It's the first week that I actually missed my self-imposed deadline. Now, there were a couple of times when I was wrapping up the editing right at about 11.45. (laughs) Uh, Usually, I try to get things done um, a lot earlier than that. But sometimes, well, life just happens. Anyhow, enough of that. Before we jump into this episode, I did want to just talk a little bit about uh, the 4th of July. Now, I realize that not everybody who listens to this podcast is from the United States, but based on the stats that I have, the vast majority of my audience is from the U.S., and so to you, I did want to to wish you a very, very happy uh, Independence Day, and also really just to leave you with this simple thought, and that is that freedom is not free. And that the struggle for liberty and independence is always present with us. I don't want to get too political, but I will say this much. And that is that while the United States of America certainly is not perfect, she has her flaws, uh, the scars of the past. Having said that, I am very, very thankful that I live in the United States of America, that I have the opportunity to raise my family here that I can enjoy most (laughs) of my freedoms, especially living here in upstate New York where King Andrew Cuomo reigns supreme. But like I said, I'm not going to get too political, um, but I am very, very grateful and thankful for those uh, who have fought so that we can live in a free country. With that said, let's jump right into this week's Homestead Happenings and let me bring you up to speed with what we've been doing here on 3B Farm and Homestead. This week, we finished weaning our piglets that uh, were born in, when was it? It was back, it was in April, maybe? April time frame, I think, is when they were born. And usually, I try to wean them at about eight weeks. I went a little longer than that this time. And it it really wasn't planned. It was because I didn't have a a place to put them. I I didn't have another pen. I needed to build a pen where I could kind of shuffle some pigs around and have uh, an area that was far enough away from the sow uh, where they would uh, not be squealing and getting her all worked up. And uh, so my son and I got that set up last, I believe it was Sunday that we did that. And then uh, how I wean my piglets is I will pull them off two at a time um, because I want the sow to dry off um, gradually. And so that's just how I do it. I pull them two at a time. And uh, since there was only five piglets, it didn't really take that long. It was a couple of days and uh, they were they were all pulled. They've all been eating 
of food for a long time now. And I really could have and should have, especially with this sow, I should have weaned them a lot earlier. This sow, for some reason, really, really loses conditioning when she is, uh, when she is nursing. My other sow, Sage, she doesn't. Uh, I, what I will do with her is I will up her ration to, to two quarts of feed twice a day, uh, up from one quart of feed twice a day. But with basil, I will up her ration to three quarts of feed and she still loses conditioning. So I'm kind of on the fence about whether or not I want to breed her again or if I'm going to maybe move her on down the road um, because sage and basil are sisters. And so it would be nice to get some different bloodlines in here Um Really, optimally, it would be great to get another boar, but I just don't have the land for that. So it is what it is, and and I love my boar. I I don't. Uh, I know really best practice is probably to bring in a new boar to bring new bloodlines in, but I just love that. I love that pig so much. Anyhow, I'm getting way off track here. So we weaned the piglets this week. Um, we also spent some time doing a little bit of cleanup. We had a lot of rain this week, and so that really made a mess of the pig areas. Uh, and the duck and geese areas. Um, and so my son and I did some clean out, brought some fresh wood chips up. And so things really, really look nice. Along with that rain, it's just amazing to me how you can water your garden and it does all right, but you get a rain and the way that garden just explodes, it just amazes me. And so the garden really, really has exploded. Uh, it just looks really, really nice. I actually haven't posted any pictures to Instagram or Facebook. I don't think I posted any um, this week. So I really need to get out there and get some pictures for you. But things are just looking really good. Now, they're not looking as great as they did at the beginning part of the week. Because unfortunately, the deer have found my garden. And uh, when I was posting some pictures on I don't remember if it was it was uh, Reddit or it could have been one of the homesteading groups. People were asking me why I didn't have my garden fenced. And really up to this point, I've not had a lot of problem with deer in my garden. I've had a little bit of problem now and again, but uh, not, a, not a huge problem. But uh, Monday night, I think it was, I noticed that they had been nibbling uh, Tuesday night, they came in and mowed down a whole section of peas. They ate off two or three different sections of green beans. Um, and, uh, yeah. So Wednesday night, my son and I set up some poly wire. And what we did is we set up T posts, uh, with poly wire at 18, 36 and 54 inches. And then we came off of the T post with some short plastic electric fence posts and we strung another line of poly wire at about 18 inches high. Now, from what I understand, that kind of creates this 3D effect in the deer's eyes, and they're not really quite sure how to get over it. Um, so that's what I've done. I'm not quite sure yet whether or not it's working because there was so much deer damage that they had done before that I can't tell whether or not what's been eaten off is freshly eaten off or if it is residual deer damage from before. It appears to be residual deer damage from before, but I did notice a few other plants that I thought hadn't been chewed on by the deer that have some evidence of some munching. <laughs> and so tonight I added another level of uh, deer protection, so to speak. And that is I took strips of aluminum foil and, uh, and, and kind of hooked them to the top line so that they will flutter and, and kind of hit up against each other and cause some noise. And we'll see. A friend of mine suggested that. And so we'll see if that helps with my with my deer issue. Now I could electrify the the um, the fence and I did buy a solar powered energizer, but I'm really holding off putting it out there because if I can get away with not using that, I will take that back and get back my $180 that that sucker cost me. So I'm really trying to avoid using it, but if I need to, I will. But I'd love to hear from you what your ideas are with regards to what you do for deer prevention. 
Um, I've heard people suggest that you use Irish spring soap and I tried that one year and I, I, I don't know. Um, it just seemed to make a mess. Um, but I've also heard people say use hair, um, or to pee around your garden. Now I've hesitated on peeing around my garden because my garden is very visible from the road and the road is fairly heavily trafficked. Although we do sit back off of the road, uh, my, my garden is very visible to the road. So I'm not really quite sure how my neighbors would feel and how the passing traffic would feel if they saw me out there peeing around my garden. <laughs> so I've, I've, now I know I could pee in bottles and take it out and pour it around, but that's kind of icky to me. So I, I've chosen not to do that. But if you have any great uh, ideas or tips or tricks on what I can do to keep the deer away, I'd love to hear them fr from you. You can reach out to me, Brian, at thehomesteadjourney.net or leave them in the comments uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or you can also uh, leave them in the comments on our uh, Facebook page or on our Instagram account. So I'd love to hear your dear uh, solutions um, besides shooting them because they're not in season right now. Uh, then the other thing I did uh, in the garden this week is I spent uh, quite a bit of time tying up tomatoes. Um, it's just that time where they're really starting to explode. So I'm trying to get them trained to go up the trellis. I'm getting the beans and the cucumbers working up the trellis. And uh, so things are really looking nice out there, though. And I tell you what, folks, the I, I did post a picture of the I have some red scarlet runner beans and they are just absolutely beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful flowers, and they're starting to grow up my hoop trellis, so that looks really, really nice. Finally, we have been enjoying veggies from the garden. We've been enjoying peas and broccoli and lettuce and spinach, and uh, it's just been uh, enjoyable to enjoy the fruits of our labor. Um, we've been thinning out carrots. We'll be having those tomorrow. I've got some beets and some turnips that need to be thin. We'll probably be roasting those. Uh, and it's just that time of year when we're starting to enjoy the abundance from the garden. And I'm just so thankful for all of that. So that's what's been going here, uh, going on here on the homestead. I hope things are well where you are at and uh, that your garden is doing well and that the deer are staying away. All right, let's jump over to this week's Charting the Course. <laughs> So this week's topic is one that I have been thinking about for, well, quite a while. And in fact, it was back, you may remember a couple of months ago, my freezer quit. And I was getting ready to harvest my Cornish Cross meat birds. And I didn't have a freezer in which to put those meat birds. You may also recall that I shared with you that if you weren't aware of this, that right now, because of the whole COVID thing, um, there are a lot of people who are buying freezers because they're trying to store food for long term. Um, and not just that, because of all of the, again, the craziness with COVID, there was a limited supply of freezers coming into the United States because many of them, if not all of them, but a lot of them are manufactured in China. And so uh, that really caused a lot of uh, consternation for me, shall we say, when uh, I went to go buy a freezer to replace the one that had failed and I wasn't able to find one within 250 miles of me, uh, new in the store. Now, thankfully, I was able to, uh, to find one on Facebook Marketplace and it's worked out well for us, but it really got me to thinking about alternative methods of preserving meat. You see, for many people, when they think about preserving meat, the first thing that comes to mind, and in many cases, the only thing that comes to mind is freezing. And while that's certainly a good option, and it's a relatively cheap and foolproof option, it is just that. It's an option. And what many people don't realize is that there are many other ways that you can safely preserve meat on your homestead without the use of a freezer. And so when I, my freezer quit and I was, you know, again, trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? I've got these meat birds, they're getting ready. And, 
anybody that knows anything about Cornish cross knows is, knows you can push them a little bit. But once you get to that maybe 10 to 12 week mark, at that point, you start losing birds to heart attacks, to broken bones. Um, so you have this window within which you have to process your birds. And so that's where I found myself kind of trying to figure out, okay, what's my backup plan to all of this? But when you stop and you think about freezers, in the grand scheme of things, the freezer is relatively a new option with regards to preserving meat. In fact, if you do some research into it, the first freezers were actually invented just a little over a hundred years ago. And so stop and think, what did people do before then? Obviously people ate meat and people preserved meat without freezers for literally thousands of years. Long before the USDA or the FDA or whatever alphabet soup agency is supposed to uh, be in charge of, and I use huge air quotes here, food safety, um, before they ever existed, people were doing these things and they survived. Amazingly, without the USDA, without the FDA, without the HIJK elemental P, people <laughs> survived. Now, do keep in mind, just like anything, if you don't do it properly, you could sicken or even kill people with alternative methods of food preservation. Really, quite frankly, you can with a freezer. You know, if your freezer were to lose power and the meat were to start to spoil and then it were to freeze again and then you were to cook that up, you could sicken people, right? So really any method of food preservation, if not done properly, can lead to sickening people or even death. And unfortunately, uh, back in the day, shall we say, the way people learned how not to preserve something was by people getting sick and dying. And so we are very, very blessed to live in a day and age where we understand from a scientific perspective why certain food preservation techniques work and what the dangers are. And we also live in an era of easy access to information. But that's also a double-edged sword, right? Because of the internet, anyone can put up a blog Anyone can start a podcast. Anyone can launch a YouTube channel. People can post things to chat rooms and to message boards and to Facebook groups, and there's no peer review. There's really no level of expertise whatsoever. And that can be very, very dangerous because when you stop and you think back to how things used to be done, these methods were passed on from generation to generation. This expertise was passed on from master butchers to apprentice butchers and so on and so forth. But now we have Joe Blow in Idaho, who's launched a blog. <laughs> Brian in upstate New York, who's launched a podcast. And all of that is great, but it can be very, very dangerous. You know, I see it sometimes in the canning groups. In fact, I was reading one of the canning groups today uh, and somebody had asked about, uh, they were struggling, they're struggling to find a pressure canner. Right now, pressure canners are in short supply. They're struggling to find a pressure canner. And so they were saying, well, can I hot water bath things? And thankfully, there were a few sane people in the group that said, well, you can certainly hot water bath some things, but there's certain things that you should never, ever hot water bath. Of course, you had these other people are saying, oh, no, 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 no. I've hot water bathed meat for years and it's never been a problem. I've hot water bathed low acid fruit for every for years and it's never been a problem. I've, I hot water bath vegetables and it's no issue. Well, folks, that's just absolutely horrible, horrible advice. And I don't want to jump too far down this rabbit hole, but there's this thing called botulism. It's odorless, it's tasteless, and it can kill you. And it is a toxin that is produced in low oxygen and low acid environments by a very, very commonly found bacterium. And so if you are hot water bath canning low acid vegetables or meats, 
you potentially could sicken or even kill somebody. And so that's why it's so important that when you are in this age of easy access to information, you need to be very, very careful about the sources that you're listening to to ensure that the person whose advice you're taking knows what the heck they're talking about. And again, folks, I'm not saying this to scare you from the standpoint of, oh my goodness, oh, I'm going to die if I try this. But on the other hand, I want you to understand that if you don't do these techniques correctly, yes, you could sicken or kill somebody. So you just need to find experts in whatever area it is that you're interested in, in, in maybe investigating to make sure that you understand the rules, you understand the right ways of, of preserving meat to ensure that you are not sickening or killing your family. Again, just because Joe Blow from Idaho has a blog does not an expert make. Just because Brian from upstate New York does not has a has a podcast does not an expert make. Just because someone has a YouTube channel with a large following does not an expert make. Just because someone has started a Facebook or a MeWe group dedicated to a topic does not an expert make. So be wary of internet-based experts. Vet them. Do your due diligence. Find out how long they've been doing this. You know, some people will do prosciutto once and they think they're an expert. <laughs> They'll make salami once, they think they're an expert. So find out how long they've been doing this. How did they learn? You know, this is one of those areas where, in my opinion, you may want to take some classes or at least read some books and not just rely on the electronic Although that, that can be good stuff. And there are online classes, and I've linked to, to food preservation classes um, from reputable sources. But again, just make sure when you're getting into these things that you're listening to experts, you're following expert advice. You want to make sure you're learning the basics, that you know the rules, so to speak. And then if you decide that you want to push the boundaries, you at least know the science behind it and the risks that you're taking when you experiment. So, if doing these other techniques could be dangerous, then why consider doing them instead of just freezing the meat? And that's a great question, a very valid question. Well, first of all, other means of food preservation isn't just necessarily to preserve the meat, but they also give a certain flavor profile to the meat that's tasty and enjoyable. I mean, many of us enjoy pepperoni. Uh, we enjoy uh, salami. Um, maybe we enjoy prosciutto. Right? Those are all alternatively preserved meats. Second, doing some work ahead of time can then result in convenience later. So, for example, if you choose to can meat, it kind of becomes homestead fast food. You know, maybe you come home, you forgot to take something out of the freezer... And so you can crack open a can of meat and a can of vegetables and maybe some broth and throw them in a pot and chop up some vegetables and bam, you've got a soup or you've got a stew. You know, you can throw all that together with some pasta and you've got a great casserole. So it, it, it's, it's kind of like this homestead fast food. And then in the case of a power outage, that meat can be eaten cold because it's already cooked. So there's a convenience that comes later because you put in some work ahead of time. Third, this can be a lot of fun. Once you understand the rules, you can then experiment with different techniques, different herbs, different ingredients, different meat combinations to achieve foods that are different and maybe more in line with what you like, with what your tastes are. And finally, while freezers are relatively safe and easy to use, they certainly aren't 100% foolproof and without their own set of issues. They require an energy source. In most cases, electricity, but there are also gas-powered versions of freezers. But that need for energy, whether it's gas or whether it's electricity, it can be an issue for some people. 
Some people live off grid. Some people live way out in the middle of nowhere. And so for them, electricity isn't an option. They, they maybe have solar, but they don't want to be burning all of their stored power by running a freezer all the time. Maybe it's difficult for them to source gas. They might live in an area where storms knock out their power frequently. Some people are very, very environmentally conscious and they're concerned about their energy consumption. And so they don't want to use electricity or gas if they can avoid it to power equipment. And then some people are concerned about a catastrophic event that could lead to a grid failure and or a gas supply disruption. So if you have a freezer, those are all things that you may need to think about or, or you might be a little worried about. Freezers, if they are left open, <laughs> uh, the food can spoil. Ask me how I know that. Unfortunately, we have had a couple of times with our upright freezer where the door did not close all the way, it was left ajar, and we lost food as a result. Uh, I did end up connecting a child safety lock to it to make sure that the door was held closed. And on our new freezer, it actually has a lock so I can lock it closed. But sometimes freezers get left open and then the food in them spoils. Sometimes freezers fail. We had a situation where we were on, uh, I think my in-laws for Christmas, and somebody hit the telephone pole across the road from us, and it took the power out. And that power surge actually, uh, I, I can't remember what part of the freezer was affected, but it took out, I think it was a control board, was zapped by that power surge. And the food in my freezer went bad. Like I said earlier in this episode, a couple of months ago, my freezer just died. Now, thankfully, we did have another freezer. We were able to consolidate everything, didn't lose a whole lot. But when these freezers fail, I found that they usually fail at the most inconvenient of times. <laughs> they may fail uh, like uh, mine did in the middle of a, a pandemic where it's hard to source a freezer or they may fail like mine did several years ago. Again, as I shared, where the uh, electric, uh, electricity went out while we were gone, and, uh, and then the, the freezer was zapped, and we lost the food. But freezers can go bad. And then we just kind of take for granted that we'll be able to get one, that they're going to be readily available, and then you're in the middle of a pandemic and you can't get one. So again, while freezers are relatively easy, they're relatively foolproof, they certainly are not without their own set of issues. So having said all of that, what are some of the other means of meat preservation that can be done on your homestead? Now this certainly is not going to be a comprehensive list of the ways that you can preserve meat. This is certainly not going to be an in-depth how-to about the different ways that you can preserve meat. But these are some of the most common methods that uh, I know of and that I discovered when I was kind of doing some research for this episode. And my goal is really to just make you aware of the options that exist. And hopefully there'll be something in this list that maybe piques your interest. And it might be something that you are interested in pursuing. Now, some of these, I do have some recommended resources. I'm not going to put them in the show notes, but if you are interested in pursuing some of these and you're wondering who I would recommend as far as experts that you might want to learn from, reach out to me, Brian at thehomesteadjourney.net uh, or contact me on Facebook or on Instagram, and I'll be glad to share those with you. So the first thing that comes to my mind is an age-old, age-old methodology, and that's curing slash salting. It's using salt uh, to preserve meat. And this can be done with many, many different types of meat. Everything from beef to pork uh, to, to ducks to chickens. I don't know about chickens, but I know with ducks and geese you can do this. And what you do is you submerge the meat in a box of salt and, uh, and let it set. 
and there's a little bit more to it than that. But uh, there's curing salts. There's different kinds of salts. But you put it in there. It's called a it's it's dry cure. And uh, sometimes they'll put a weight on it, and they're trying to push some of the moisture out of the meat, have it absorb the salt. And what it does is it keeps the bad bacteria from being able to multiply. And then the good bacteria can start working on the meat and maybe fermenting it a little bit. So things like country ham, prosciutto, salt cod, um, some bacons, uh, copa, sausages, salamis. There's just a whole lot of different things that would fall into this category where either they are submerged in salt or there's a significant amount of salt that's mixed into it and then they're allowed to age and that salt not only um, keeps the bad bacteria from from um, multiplying but it helps to draw out the moisture and cause that meat to uh, to dry out. Now we actually right now have a uh, uh, country ham slash prosciutto that is curing in our basement. And it has been hanging there now for 18 months. I actually hung it there in December of, it's actually 19 months, well, almost 19 months. It was the end of December, I think, of 2018. So 18 going on 19 months, it's been aging in our basement. And there's a lot of other um, examples of that that I am interested in trying. I'm actually going to be doing some prosciutto with some duck and some geese, uh, this ducks and geese this fall. When I harvest them, I'm going to try my hand at doing duck breast and goose breast prosciutto. So that'll be a lot of fun. And so you'll definitely want to follow that on Facebook and Instagram. But preserving things in salt has been done for years and years and years and years. Now, you can also preserve meat in a brine, and this is very closely related to the salt method. It's just that instead of it being a dry salt or a salt box that the, the meat is stored in or initially stored in, it is submerged in a liquid that, generally speaking, is salt-based. And the same uh, concept applies in that the salt is being drawn into the meat, and then that is going to help preserve, keep the bad bacteria from being able to multiply. And it also imparts, depending on the brine, it can impart flavors and so on and so forth. But things like your corned beef, a pastrami, um, hams are all examples of things that have been brined for preservation. Another way that you can preserve meat is actually to submerge it in lard. So you take the meat and you pour melted lard over it and uh, you set it in a cool place. Now, obviously this is going to be very temperature sensitive. It's going to have to be a very cool area where you're going to store that. Um, there are some other concerns with regards to that, but that is some another way that people preserved meat for many, many years was just to submerge the meat within lard. You may have in the past heard people refer to a pantry as a larder. And the basis of that word comes from back in the day when they would preserve meat in lard and then store it in a cool place. Um, and by, by about the 18th century, the term uh, had expanded to include areas where they store dry goods and so forth, what we would refer to as a pantry. But the root of the term larder can be traced back to when people preserved meat by submerging it in lard. Now, by and large, the first three methods that we talked about, curing and salting, brining and larding, they don't really require specialized equipment. Now, you might make a case that depending on how you are aging the meats after you've cured them or salted them or even brined them, some people will have um, special humidity controlled chambers in which they are keeping the meat and so forth. But for centuries, people didn't have any of that and used those methods um, without any issue. And so someone on a homestead, even in a really basic sense, would be able to at least try simple things like uh, maybe a duck 
breast prosciutto or a goose breast prosciutto or even prosciutto from the uh, hind leg of a pig um, without any kind of specialized equipment. But the next three methods of food preservation we're going to talk about, now you're having to start buying a little bit of equipment. So the first one is canning. If you're going to can meat, and you certainly can can meat, um, you are going to need a pressure canner. Hot water bathing meat is not a good idea, bad, bad idea in my opinion. You always should pressure can meat. Now, a lot of people are freaked out and scared of pressure canners. Pressure canners are very, very safe and they're very, very easy to use. Get a good book like the Ball Book of Food Preservation and you are going to be all set. But canning meat is something that can easily, easily be done. You can can beef, you can can chicken, you can can fish. You, I mean, you can can meat in a variety of different methods. And like I said earlier, it becomes kind of like this homestead fast food because as you can that meat, it ends up cooking that meat. So you can eat it cold, you can warm it up, you can put it in stews, you can put it in soups, you can put it in casseroles. There is just a whole lot of different things that you can do with that meat and it will store for a very long time in a cool dark place uh, and be very, very good to use and you're not having to use any kind of energy whatsoever to preserve it. We have found not only does it make things easy, but it also takes meat that otherwise might not be quite as appetizing and it turns it into something that is absolutely scrumptious. That is how I preserve my hens. So when I butcher my hens off in the fall, I pressure can them and it tenderizes them and it is just absolutely delicious. But not only that, the stock, Oh my goodness, the broth. Oh, it is so delicious. And then you can can that up and now you have broth, you have stock on your shelf. You're not having to go to the store to buy it. And folks, it is a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times better than anything you would ever buy in the store. Well, I don't know, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but folks, it is so, so good. So canning meat is another way that you can preserve a meat harvest. Dehydrating meat is something else that you can do. Now, a lot of times this will be done in combination with either a brining or a salting, but not always. But you can do this either with a solar dehydrator or you can buy a dehydrator machine that will then help dehydrate things and turn things into like jerky. Another option that you have is freeze drying meat. Now this is not something that I have done myself, uh, but I have read of people doing it. Freeze dryers are a little bit uh, more on the expensive side, so it's definitely going to be a, big, a bigger investment than a canner or a dehydrator. In fact, I did a quick Google search on it and freeze dryers that I'm seeing here are two to three thousand dollars. Whereas a all-American canner, which is kind of considered to be the Cadillac of canners, it, depending on the size you get, is less than 500 bucks. And many of them are more in like the $275 range. Uh, free or a, uh, a dehydrator. We just bought um, an Excalibur dehydrator, and I think it was like 250 bucks. So a freeze dryer is certainly a much more expensive option but it certainly is an option. Finally, another option that you have with regards to preserving meat for long-term storage is to simply preserve it on the hoof. Now, what do I mean by that? It simply means that you harvest the animal when you need it. That's really how back in the day, especially with chicken, that's what they would do. They would keep the chickens around. This was, in, in many cases, you're thinking before the days of uh, the Cornish cross. And they would have extra roosters and they would just go harvest a rooster when they wanted chicken for dinner. And so that's certainly an option uh, for your homestead. Now, that's not going to work well with a Cornish cross, but it is something that you could 
conceivably do with a standard breed chicken. You could do it with goats. You could do it with pigs. Just harvest them when you want them. And then you don't have to store anything. Uh, another thing that people used to do back in the day is they would wait till it got cold. And then they would harvest something and they would just hang it up and they would cut on it and eat it through the winter. Now, that's certainly not going to work well in Florida. <laughs> and really, in our day and age up here in upstate New York, it's not going to work well because the cold is so inconsistent up here anymore that um, you wouldn't dare do that. But if you live up in the middle of nowhere, Alaska, that might be a great option for you. So either on the hoof and, you know, kind of storing it on the hoof alive and then harvesting it as you need it. Now, there was another method that I was, I kind of debated over whether or not I should include it or not. And that is smoking. A lot of people think about smoking as a means of food preservation. But as I really delved into it, and again, certainly I am no expert by any stretch of the imagination, but as I delved into it, really what I came to understand is that smoking in and of itself really does not preserve meat. Now, it may keep, if you were just to smoke meat, not apply any salt or anything like that, you were just to smoke meat, it might uh, extend the shelf life of the meat for maybe a week or two beyond what, you know, if you were just to, to put it in the fridge or something. Um, but it's really not, in and of itself, a great option for long-term preservation of meat. Where it becomes an, a, a, a method for long-term preservation is when the meat has been cured or salted or brined, and it's really that process that has preserved the meat, and smoking is simply adding flavor. And so I didn't really include that as a means of food preservation because I'm not convinced that smoking in and of itself really does preserve meat. So what do we do here on our homestead? Well, I've really given you an overview of what we do or what we are in the process of doing. Besides a freezer, we currently can meat and broth. Uh, I can my layers. I freeze my Cornish cross. I'm also experimenting with curing meat. Um, I was actually scheduled to take a charcuterie class. That's a tough word to say, charcuterie. Um, and it's an even tougher word to spell. But I was scheduled to take a charcuterie class this spring, and unfortunately that was postponed until this fall due to COVID. At least hopefully it will go on this fall, but it was at least postponed. And as I shared with you, I do have some prosciutto hanging in my basement, and I am going to be experimenting this fall with duck and goose prosciutto, and hopefully I'm also going to start some more prosciutto with the young boar that I'm going to harvest in December. I also do have plans in the future to experiment with brining uh, some meat and smoking it. And uh, as I said earlier, we just purchased a dehydrator, and so I want to use that to make some jerky and so forth. I honestly doubt I'll ever use larding, and I don't think I'll ever buy a freeze dryer. Um, but uh, who knows? You know, never say never. Uh, and if one of the companies that makes freeze dryers were to send one to me to try out, I certainly would not say no. So what are methods that you have used other than freezing on your homestead? Uh, have you had success using any of these methods or are there some methods that I didn't talk about that uh, you think maybe I should have covered? Again, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me, Brian, at thehomesteadjourney.net, or you can contact us via our social media accounts. Hopefully, you found this helpful and interesting. If you have any questions, reach out to me. If you are interested in my thoughts on some experts or maybe some next steps to take, I would definitely be glad to help answer your questions. And folks, again, while I, I spent a lot of time at the beginning talking about food safety, and I really I want to caution you not to go just off uh, uh, crazy with this, um, certainly 
These are techniques that you can use on your homestead safely, and you do not need to be scared of them. Well, that is it for this week's episode of the Homestead Journey podcast. I hope you have enjoyed it and found it uh, informative and helpful. If you have, if you could do me a favor and jump on over to iTunes or whatever it is your whatever is your favorite podcast player of choice and leave me a review, I would really, really appreciate it. And then share this episode with people that you think might find it interesting and informative. Um, I really, really would greatly appreciate that. If you haven't already, make sure you like our Facebook page and follow us on Instagram. And also check out our website, thehomesteadjourney.net. I try to keep it updated periodically with things that are going here on here on the uh, homestead. And uh, so check that out as well. As always, the music on this episode was provided by Audionautics.com. So a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.